Hi, I'm Jeff Klein, editor of Radio Graphics, and today I am pleased to have with us Dr. Jason Eatry, currently of the Department of Radiological Sciences at the Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center, who is the first author of one of our Fundamentals Interactive Presentations, which appears online in our core learning section of the November 2018 issue of Radiographics. His presentation is entitled Extrahepatic Cholangiocarcinoma, What the Surgeon Needs to Know. Jason, welcome to our podcast. Thanks for having me on the podcast, Jeff. Jason, your presentation, uh, which you created along with uh, Dr. Edouard DeLang, uh, was created while you were at, uh, on the faculty at the University of Virginia Health Sciences System. How did you come up with the idea for this particular exhibit? Yeah, I have to give a lot of credit to Dr. DeLonga because he's been doing this kind of work for the last 30 or 40 years at UVA. Uh, he pioneered the use of MRI, and, and he has a lot of interest in, in biliary pathology, and he's been collecting cases for a long time. So I was a new junior faculty at UVA and going through a case of extrabatic cholangiocarcinoma. So I went to, to talk to him and get his opinion, and he was sharing with me a lot of his knowledge, and he brought up a presentation um, that I think had been a refresher course a few years before. And as he was going through the presentation and showing the different examples he had of the um, types of extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and then the animations he had created of the different surgical approaches, the first thing that crossed my mind was this would be great for RSNA educational exhibit and for radiographics. So I pitched the idea. He liked the idea. I helped format it for the uh, educational exhibit format and, and for the online presentation. We were missing just a couple of cases. He had fantastic cases that he had been collecting, um, but we were missing a, a, what I thought was a great example of a bismuth type two, and then the introductal growing component. So um, I went through and searched our data repository. I looked at every path proven case of cholangiocarcinoma we had at UVA and found that example of the type two cholangio that you'll see in the exhibit, which was great. Um, we were still missing the introductal growing type. So I reached out to Dr. Raf Tapuni at Wake Forest, and he was able to provide a nice example. And that's how we got our exhibit. Terrific. Well, we're glad that you did. So now in the first part of your presentation, you review some of the epidemiology related to cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, let's take a look at slide number four of the presentation and have you give us some background information related to intra and extra hepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Thanks. I think the first important point is how to differentiate intra and extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So that depends on where the tumor originates. So if the tumor originates proximal to or above the secondary biliary radicals, that's generally considered intrahepatic. And if it originates distal or below the secondary biliary radicals, that's considered extra extrahepatic. You can see that most cholangiocarcinoma are extrahepatic. The five-year survival for either one of these is not great. Um, but slightly better for extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. There are not many of these cases per year in the U.S., about two to 3,000 cases, but I think they happen often enough that if you're in a tertiary care center with referrals, you're going to see these. I see these about once a month at Wake Forest, and we see these um, with surprising frequency at UVA as well. Um, the reported incidence of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma in the U.S. has increased over the last 40 years, but I think that's more of a byproduct of how cholangiocarcinomas have been classified over that time period. So I think the, the incidence in the U.S. really has been similar um, over the last 40 years. Most cases are going to present over the age of 65 years. Um, the, the big risk factor in the U.S. is primary sclerosis and cholangitis, um, but despite that, most cases are sporadic and are not related to PSC. So most of the cases in our exhibit are sporadic presentations of extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Most of the cases you're going to see at presentation are uh, too advanced for curative resection, but um, a subset of those are going to be appropriate for curative resection, and I think that's why it's important to understand the material in this exhibit, um, talking about the involvement of the biliary tree and, and vasculature, uh, because when you come across those cases that are resectable, it's important to identify that and so that that patient has an opportunity for cure. Sure. Well, thank you for that. So, Jason, in the next part of the presentation, you detail the growth patterns associated with cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, let's take focus now on uh, the extrahepatic lesions, and we'll take a look at slides number 9 and 10, which detail the bismuth carlet classification system for cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, 
So bismuth correlate classification system is one of several, and it's not the only criteria used to determine resectability, but it's used to determine the, the approach, the surgical approach. Um, and it also helps decide whether the patient is resectable. Uh, you also have to consider vascular involvement and nodal involvement and, and metastatic disease, but that we'll talk about that in, in some of the later slides. The, the left and middle diagrams are both type 1 cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, there's no subset difference between the two. The only reason we uh, show those differently is that the surgical approach is slightly different between the two, so that's why we differentiate the two, but really they're both distal cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, the classic type 2 hyalur cholangiocarcinoma is in the diagram on the right, and that's your clat skin tumor that involves the confluence of the right and left hepatic ducts, but does not extend to order to involve the second order branches. On the next slide, you're gonna see the variations of the 3A, 3B, and 4 type cholangiocarcinomas, where on the left you have the 3A that involves the hyaline, but also extends to order this, to involve the second order branches on the right. And the 3B, which is the diagram in the middle, that extends to involve the secondary order branches on the left. Uh, the 3A tends to be more common only because the right hepatic duct tends to be shorter than the left hepatic duct. And then if the tumor goes on to involve the second order radicals on both the left and the right, that's considered a bismuth type 4 and generally is considered unresectable. And that's the diagram on the right. Great. Well, that's, uh, thank you for that. So let's take a look at some cases now. You have a series of cases that include some MR and MRCP with nice diagrams of the lesion uh, that illustrate the classification of tumors based on location and extent of disease. Uh, so let's take a look at some cases now. Sure. So the first case is going to be the distal cholangiocarcinoma, and this one is distal to the origin of the cystic duct. Um, so in diagram A, you can see the very thick walled stricture of the common bile duct, and there's a little piece of dilated cystic duct that you can see coming off just proximal to it. Um, that's your one of the three key sequences I think you use for all of these extra hepatic cholangiocarcinomas. The three key sequences are, are shown here, A, B, and C. It's the T2-weighted sequence, the MRCP sequence, and the post-contrast sequence. In B, you see a similar um, picture to what you saw with the coronal T2, where you've got a very tight stricture of the common bile duct with upstream biliary ductal dilation. And then in C, you have your post-contrast image that shows you the tumor. Um, that's the green arrow. This is a subtraction image, so it's a little hard to see uh, the tumor. It looks very similar to surrounding liver. But what I'm highlighting there is the proper hepatic artery as it courses right next to the tumor. And the important point about that is if you continue to see the fat plane around the vessel, that it's not involved. If the vessel was involved in this case, then it would be considered resectable. But since the vessel is not involved, it's considered uh, this case is considered resectable. Great. Uh, let's move on to determining resectability. You provide some diagrams of bismuth 1 through bismuth uh, 3B tumors and describe the surgical approach for each of these. And then you describe unresectable lesions. Uh, this latter issue may be the most important for the radiologist to recognize uh, so as to help avoid uh, any attempts at futile resection uh, of these lesions. Slide 27 shows such a case. Can we review this? Sure. This uh, is another example of a distal cholangiocarcinoma. Um, there are five uh, images here. Um, a is showing you the coronal T2-weighted image with fat saturation, and the green arrow is pointing to that distal cholangiocarcinoma, the, the thick-walled stricture that's causing upstream dilation, and you also see dilation of the gallbladder. B is a nice ERCP image showing the same tight stricture with thick walls and some shouldering and upstream dilation. As part of evaluating uh, extrapatic cholangiocarcinoma, it's important to look at the bismuth correlate classification and determine involvement of the biliary tree, but also vascular involvement, um, the hepatic arterial system and the portal venous system. So in image C is an axial T1 weighted fat sap post-contrast image. And the blue arrow is showing you encasement of the gastrodenal artery. And as you follow that up, to its insertion or its origin on the common hepatic. Um, that fourth image, D, is a coronal post-contrast T1-weighted fat sat image, and that shows you soft tissue encasement of the common and proper hepatic artery. So that 
um, similar to what you see with the pancreatic cancer, encasement of that vessel does preclude surgery. And if you had not had that extension of tumor, this would have been considered resectable. Great. So next, you detail the relative utility of CT, ERCP, and MR in imaging these patients. And you provide an MR and MRCP protocol. You also provide a nice reporting guideline on slide 31. Uh, can we go over your recommended reporting guideline that you illustrate here? Yes, and I think this is one of the most important parts of this exhibit because uh, with any kind of uh, cancer imaging, particularly when you're talking about staging and deciding what type of therapy or, or management they should have, I think it's important to have a checklist approach. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of similarity between this approach um, with cholangiocarcinoma and with something like pancreatic cancer, where it's not enough just to identify the primary tumor. You have to talk about its extent of involvement. So here's uh, what I consider a checklist approach to reporting anything you think could be a cholangiocarcinoma. So anytime I see a stricture of the extrapatic um, biliary tree that could be malignant, um, this is what I include in my report. I talk about biliary involvement and I think about the bismuth correlate classification. So um, where in the biliary tree do you see the stricture? How long does it go? Some of the descriptions of the stricture. And, and what's really important is, does it extend into the hilum and does it involve the secondary biliary radicals on the left or right? And remember that if it does on both sides, that tends to imply a bismuth correlate type four, which is unresectable. So you wanna talk about the bile ducts. Uh, you wanna talk about portal vein involvement you can use the same descriptors for cholangiocarcinoma as you can with pancreatic cancer, um, talking about abutment of less than 180 degrees versus encasement. And you can also use the descriptors uh, like narrowing or irregularity of the lumen that imply vascular invasion. So you want to look at the main portal vein, you want to look at the right and left portal veins and talk about abutment or encasement. And you also want to talk about any variant anatomy that may be present. For the hepatic artery, it's a similar approach. Uh, you want to follow the common hepatic and the proper hepatic and determine if there's any abutment or encasement. And you also want to talk about if there's any aberrant arterial anatomy. And I think one of the last cases we're going to look at is going to be an example of aberrant arterial anatomy with involvement. Um, it's important to talk about lymph nodes and just keep in mind that Imaging is not great for lymph nodes, but if you see abnormal enlarged lymph nodes, particularly if they're beyond the hepatoduodenal ligament, it's important to describe those, whether they're enlarged or morphologically abnormal. So periortic, pericaval, SMA, celiac, and common hepatic lymph nodes. And the final point is make sure you look in the liver and talk about any lesions in the liver and look for peritoneal disease. If you look at the data on when surgeons go in to resect cholangiocarcinoma with curative intent, the most common reason for them to abort that procedure is peritoneal disease. So it's important to include that in your checklist. Great. Thank you. It sounds very much like pancreatic adenocarcinoma in, right. in the same vein. So as you mentioned earlier, the last part of your presentation reviews the biliary and vascular variants and how they can impact uh, and determine resectability. The case on slide 35, I think, shows this nicely. Can we review this? Yes. Yeah, so this is a, a Another example of a distal cholangiocarcinoma. So if you look at figure A, that's an MRCP image, and you see that very tight stricture of the common bile duct that's distal to the insertion of the cystic duct with upstream dilation and dilation of the gallbladder. Uh, there's a stent present, so you can see a small um, T2 hyperintense signal right in the middle of that stricture. And as you're going through and looking um, at the biliary involvement, there's no extension to involve the hilum. Um, when you're looking at the hepatic arterial involvement, what you're seeing in the right-sided image B, uh, the blue arrow, this is a coronal post-contrast T1-weighted fat sat image. The blue arrow is pointing to the SMA, and arising from the SMA is a replaced right hepatic artery that courses right through the tumor. So the yellow arrow is showing you that tumor enhancing and encasing the replaced right hepatic artery, and you have some narrowing and regularity of that vessel. So Without that vascular involvement, this is resectable, but with involvement of the replaced right hepatic artery, this generally becomes unresectable. Terrific. Well, Dr. Itri, thanks for taking the time today to discuss your interactive online presentation on extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, which can be found in the current November 2018 issue of Radiographics Online. Jason, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for having me, Jeff.